I, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I didn't want to do it. Just because you're young doesn't mean, mean you will be an effective youth faster. But yeah. you focus less on all of these things because there's a smaller group of people. <laughs> <laughs> they're mutual <laughs> friends so just waiting for the stars to align yeah and that's the worst part right? <laughs> yeah, we yeah. have mutual friends and they never like uh, just they never introduced us they never they... told us somebody else existed hey guys welcome uh, to my channel or whatever as you know that when I started this uh, YouTube channel I, when I started a my first post on my first video it accidentally went viral so it was not my intention to actually go or be viral um, but nonetheless, I built up quite a substantial audience and um, I thought I just, and I mentioned and I promised that I would not be making, like I promised I would not be making regular content. But I did say that whenever, you know, something comes to mind or if, you know, the Lord prompts my spirit or my heart to do something and I would do it. Um, so yeah, uh, to, today I've actually got two friends with me, uh, David and John, and uh, in the moment I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves, but what this video is really about today is uh, I've got actually two friends who uh, were kind of like similar background, similar, sim, similar, similar uh, context where we were in, you know, we're in our like 30s, okay? You know, we, 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 were, we got into ministry, full-time church work, and I think we thought that this was something that, um, or rather the church or the position that we will be in, uh, was going to be something they would be doing for a while. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but certainly for myself, I when I got into ministry, when I got into that full-time position, my last full-time position, I thought that was for life. I had no intention or no desire or, yeah. or no thoughts to actually change direction or whatever, but here I am. So today I got two friends who uh, kind of like we're in the s same boat uh, with the intention to just share our story, share our experiences, uh, with the objective of, uh, I don't know, spreading awareness or whatever, but also just to encourage and to give a little bit of insight to those of you who maybe you are in the same position. You've been um, in, you are, you are in ministry or you just came out of ministry and you've got some questions or you've got some thoughts, you've got some things that you're going through. And uh, I just felt that maybe there is um, wisdom in uh, collective thought, right? And we'll just kind of go go with it and um, yeah, we'll see where the day takes us and where this takes us here. So that's why we're in a very, very nice, nice studio. Shout out to the guys over here, all our technical crew who are not looking, oh, they're, nod they're nodding, hello, hello. Thank you for having us and uh, organizing this space. But none, that was a really long introduction. I felt like I've been speaking for like a long, long time. So I'm going to stop speaking right now. I'm going to hand the time over to um, David and, and John. So. Maybe you guys can start off by just by telling a little, telling everyone here a little bit about yourselves. Um, you know, however much you want to tell your 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 background, what got you in the ministry. Uh, maybe let's start with that. You know, your background. What was your last ministry position and what got you there? Yeah. Hey, I'm David, and um, just good to be with friends here. Yeah. And I I guess uh, for me, I've been in ministry close to. 10 years, 10 full-time years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and currently I am, as with jo the both Johns here, we are in our 30s, uh, married uh, with a young family. And um, I think we'll leave it at that because we're going to go deep into a few other things, right? Yeah. yeah but so, um, so I'm going to pick up a little bit there, David. Um, what, so like, maybe tell a bit about your story. What got you into full-time ministry? Was mm. it a dramatic call of God? Was it a progressive thing? Was it a conversation that triggered it? Like, mm. what was it like for you? I think for me, it was more of um, that high school moment uh, where there was two pastors that came at separate moments and they kind of prayed over me mm. and they released a word and just said that you'll be a pastor someday. Wow. So uh, I kind of like said, okay, um, we'll see where, where God leads, uh, how, you know, and when, and I'll just follow. So that was when I was 17. Mm. Um, so it took a good 10 years uh, for that kind of preparation or just that molding into that whole season. And, and then I went in full time. Okay. Was that, and what, was, was that at a camp at the church that you eventually went to full, full time in or? Yeah, yeah, it was at my home church. Oh, okay. Mm. Cool, 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 cool. 
Uh, hi, I'm John. Uh, and <clears throat> I think I was in full-time ministry for five, six years. Mm. I was serving in, in well, I, I grew up in the church. and mm. uh, But I was serving uh, as a volunteer plus full-time, I think 11, 11 12 years all together. And um, mine wasn't so much of a, you know, moment. Uh, mine was, uh, I, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do it. Um, God, I mean, I, I felt God called me to it. Yep. Um, but I remember even years before I went in full time, I was a volunteer and my, my SP would talk to me or, or, they, mm. or elders would talk to me and I always said no because I knew it was a terrible job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, okay, like, it's not terrible. It was, it was very, it was very, uh, it was, it's an amazing job. Being a youth pastor, being able to impact lives, it's amazing. Yes. I think uh, what was difficult was, you know, uh, just making the decision to, to leave your career. Mm. I remember one of, the last, uh, one of the last few words that really spoke to me right, right before I went in full-time was uh, a pastor uh, from, from Singapore came and preached, and he preached about the giving, giving your... Uh, Giving God, don't don't give God your crumbs. Yeah. Wow, that that really pushed me over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Because because I think growing up in church, you always see all the pastors all quite old, right? So you always think, oh, you're gonna work first, you make your money, buy your house, get married, have children already, then mm. you, then you serve God, right? Mm. But uh, that call was like, you know, you give God uh, your best. Mm. Don't give God your your last. Mm. Don't give God your fumes, uh, you know. Mm. Yeah. So, so I, I gave God my best. So I, I, I quit. Um, uh, I think right. Uh, I can't remember when was this, but maybe at the height of my, not really my higher career. Right before I was like, you know, about to get promoted and everything. And mm. Um, mm. so, how long were you in? Um, were you in that? Were you kind of like in the marketplace before you actually went full time? I was in the marketplace for seven years. So mm. after I graduated. Mm. I, I was in the same company, just uh, hopping from department to department. Mm. So I just got promoted and promoted. Mm. Um, mm. Yep. Yeah, then I became the, the lead for research for my for the country. Mm. So I was looking at a regional role next. Wow. But, but you know, I gave God my best. Uh, I've, I think I, I, it's something that, uh, yeah, I, 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 at that time, I was all in for. Yeah. 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 I think there's well there the similarities across the three uh, of us here is that we all started as youth pastors. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, got a young youngish dude um, coming to ministry. Let's making a youth pastor. Although personally, in my experience, I think just because you're young doesn't mean mean you will be an effective youth pastor. But yeah. I think I think we did fairly all right, three of us across the board. Um, but I guess for for John, uh, I think David, you you yeah. and I pretty much went into full time ministry, right out. Uh, or we you know you you did, you had a bit of work experience yeah. as well, yeah. right? So yeah. I I was working a good eight years. Uh, oh wow! Okay, as an entrepreneur, and uh, then that call came. Uh, yeah, I knew it was time. Yeah, but uh, it was quite. I mean, in, in a sense, it's quite hard to let go. Like what John Yin is saying, because mm. you're, you're building your career uh, almost towards that peak, right? Mm. And um, you 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 just got to let it go. And at that moment, I had three companies on my own. Wow. And um, I mean, by the grace of God, it was easy per se to let it go because mm. um, God just provided that grace to say, okay, mm. let it go and it'll be all right. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I thought I thought I was going to, I was the, um, I thought uh, John was going to be the odd one out. Looks like <laughs> I'm the only one that was the odd one out where I pretty much went, you know, two feet in dive straight in or rather dive head first in, um, uh, for, into ministry. And uh, I, I feel sorry I got to do this, right? But I think for, I, I do want to tell everybody here, if you're wondering, like, what's up with these two guys? Why are their names so similar? Yes, it is actually true. Like, my name is Jonathan Ngan and that's Jonathan Ngin, N-G-I-N-N-G-A-N. If you're wondering, what is that We're typo? Yeah, I mean, and we just had to do the biblical <laughs> narrative of David and Jonathan. <laughs> That's why we, we 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 had to do that. And um, just just and I, I okay. I know I know. Whenever we get into a social setting, I feel like I have to tell this story. But yeah. yes, I remember 
the first time I ever met uh, John was at a pastor's event. And, uh, you know, at those events, you kind of had to like stick a sticker on, um, on, on uh, uh, to just kind of tell everybody who you are. So I actually saw John from, from afar, from an angle. And I saw, I could see his name tag. And you know how like, you know, you, you could recognize your name. So, I, but obviously I couldn't see into great detail all the alphabets, but I saw from an angle and I thought, man, is this guy trying to be funny? I've never met this guy before. And he just took my name tag and he's trying to masquerade it to me. So I wanted to like go and give like John a piece of my mind. But then my my frown became, quickly became a smile when I saw, what? Your name is John Yin? I'm John Yin. We're in, we're in ministry together. But anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> we are mutual friends, so just waiting for the stars to align. Yeah, and that's the worst part, right? <laughs> yeah, we yeah. are mutual friends and they never like uh, just... They never introduced us, they never told they, us somebody else existed. Yeah. They had a similar name. <laughs> and we were like, both, both, be like past, both be like ministry and whatever, but like, yeah, but cool. But like, I, I think we can... I obviously, one of the commonalities we have here is that, you know, we, we all of us went into ministry, whether it was uh, right, off the, right out of university or whether it's after different entrepreneurial or career uh, efforts. But I think we went in um, with that, like you mentioned, with that idea or that desire, hey, let's give God our best. Mm. You know, like while we've got the energy, while we've got the passion, and uh, we I think we were kind of like also try, breaking a lot of norms where like I, I had that, I had a lot of people tell me that as well, you know, like, hey, if you want to go into ministry, you should, you know, have a, you should build a career first, build up your your stability and then only go into that. But I think, you know, we 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 really sense that God called us and then we really wanted to do that. Which then, of course, leads to my next question, which um, for those of you who know me, you already have the answer, but I thought David and and um, the, um, not, the, not the other John, um, well, so I didn't want to refer to you as the other John, but I was just going, okay, John can share with us, why then did you leave ministry? Mm. Um, yeah, whoever <laughs> feels up. Uh, for me, it was because um, uh, my church was going through a rough patch. Mm. Um, I, it was, you know, multiple things happening at one time. We had COVID. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, there was some instability in leadership. Mm. And, division in leadership mm. as well. So mm. uh, the church got deregistered mm. by the home ministry. And um, I was getting, I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was something that just happened overnight. Yep. The deregistration happened overnight. It was mm. like literally we were at staff meeting and we got the letter. Yeah. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, it was like one, two, one year at least of just bickering and fighting. Mm. Uh, and I was, I was getting jaded already like, by that point. And then when it happened, you know, uh, well, you know, we served during COVID. Uh, it was tough. It was really, really tough, you know, changing everything and just wanting yeah. to hold everyone together. Uh, but, but I was still serving. But after a while, it just got more and more bitter. And I knew that if I if I stayed, I would have sinned. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. So I, I decided uh, when, I mean, because of deregistration, we all, we technically not staff. Yeah. We technically not staff. And overnight, our ministry is technically gone. And we don't know when we'll get registered back. The church is back already. They got, yep. uh, the deregistration got removed. But um, uh, but at that point, uh, we had no, we had no idea when the church would be registered back. Mm. And also, the the only precedence was like a nine month way. Mm. You know? And I was like, you know, I can't be doing this, nothing. Yeah. Two months, you know? Yeah. So you know, although the church was really good, they gave us love offering all the staff. Yeah. And you know, there was plenty of support from church members who really loved the the, the staff. But um, at a, at a certain point, I was like, I don't think I'm actually working. Mm. Mm. And also, I was a little bit bitter and struggling. Like it was it was really hard. I mean, even after I left, I was still struggling with mm. wrestle, not struggling, but wrestling with with what happened. So I decided to leave and go, you know, go work, go and work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and to give a bit of context to um, all our viewers here, whoever will be watching in, you know, and you're not from Malaysia, like um, in Malaysia, some churches actually go under the Registrar of Society, uh, the ROS, as under the Home Ministry. Uh, and what happens is when you're under that 
jurisdiction or you go through that process to actually get registered as a society or organization, there's certain um, compliances that you have to fulfill. And what could potentially happen is that if members uh, were to report you to the um, ROS and you, they were found that you did not comply certain um, rules and regulations, they can actually deregister you. So f that means that your accounts get frozen, um, your, activi your, your, your assets get frozen and all your activities have to cease. So I think um, this kind of, that you know yeah. there's there's a there was probably a horrid time that you that you were going through because not only did you lose the opportunity to meet but you you know you lost you didn't have any pay as you mentioned and everything um, and yeah wow okay we'll, we'll we'll come back we'll come back to that and um, but yeah David what about you mm. what made you uh, I leave? think mine is a, a bit strange though um, the way that God led me was. Uh, when I came in full time, um, just about a couple months later, then I kind of sense a strange tugging uh, to to think of another model of church. Mm. Um, and of course, at that time, it didn't make sense to me. Like I think many of us, we grew up in what we call corporate church, right? Mm. In that very structured environment of of church. Um, and what a lot was tugging my heart was basically to entertain the idea of house church. Mm. And of course, I knew nuts about what house church was, just being very ignorant. But, but I think along that couple of months, then the Lord opened up a door for me to be connected to a mentor. And uh, ever since then, I've been you know bouncing off the idea with him. And then uh, it took, many years because um, I think when I came in full time, the Lord wanted me to fulfill a certain task, a certain um, role uh, that he called me in for. Yep. Uh, I think all of us never have the desire for full time. Uh, it's not something that <laughs> that is your chitta chitta, your dream to be a pastor, but it's something that God calls you and then you wrestle with it and then you finally give in because of obedience, right? And so likewise for me, um, when when I came in and then, you know, I sensed, okay, that's what God wants me to do to fulfill that, that role as a youth pastor. Uh, I just had to make sure that I did it to my best. And then just when I felt the season was about to end, that was when COVID happened as well. Mm. Um, and it, it, it didn't come at the most convenient of timing. Uh, I, I knew that, that the time to leave was coming and so that was somewhere between uh, August of 2020 and then I took about a year to prepare my team to prepare the leadership of the church um, and then at August of 21 uh, that was when I transitioned out mm, so, so you, you actually gave your church like yeah uh, quite a bit of notice yeah, then because yeah. I think I think for for us I think we 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 carry a lot of portfolios with us mm. um, I think not just that past that youth pastors had, but naturally in, in that kind of setting, we, we do many things as well. Mm. And I think uh, for me, the, there was just that sense of, okay, I just need to prep uh, the different ones, taking up those roles uh, to the best of how I know it, I can do it. Yeah, so mm. so for me, it was, um, it was a long way coming. Mm. It wasn't just something that I felt you know, oh, okay, it's time to move or or I had um, uh, a bitter episode or or I had um, grievances with people. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think for me personally, it was just that sense of what was God trying to do in my life and just trying to be as obedient as I can to follow that kind of line that God was leading me with. Yeah, so I, I do want to like pick up on that a little bit. You mentioned that... Um, yeah, we're all very familiar with uh, organized or institutionalized church, mm. you know, where we've got like uh, the programs, we've got like uh, all the, min the different ministries or departments and all that. So obviously growing up in that kind of environment to then suddenly start to think of like, hey, what, let me, let's do house church or mm. what will house church look like? Yeah. I mean, yes, on one hand, yes, there's a lot's prompting and everything, but were there other 
just walk us through that thought process. I'm sure there were other things that you you kind of like were thinking about or you were processing. Yeah, what 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 led to, because that's that is a big big paradigm shift, you know, yeah. a big shift. So yeah, I think the the thought process with that was um, how am I going to earn an income, mm. right? Because it's going to be in a house and. I mean, coming from from a corporate church background, we know how we we support the church. Mm. We know how the church is run. Um, but but then there were many questions as well. And so along the years, um, the Lord kind of sent different ones along my way to show that this is a model that can work. Mm. Uh, this is a way that can work. These are people that uh, what we know now as bivocational pastors, uh, this is how they do it. And so I think the Lord was just very gracious to to slowly peel back some of these things to show me and give me that steady confidence uh, to actually make that decision. And I think what really helped me was um, was just being connected to people who are actually doing it, mm. right? And just to see how they did it and... And for me, I'm the kind of person that likes to plan. It likes to draw up plans and stuff. And and I did. I did draw up plans for myself uh, as best as I, I I could download from God. But what actually happened at the end of the day, uh, right where I am right now, is something completely different. Mm, mm. And so um, I think one of the things I've learned through that entire process of coming in full-time into corporate church and and then being prepared to leave and go into a different model of bivocationalism as a pastor, as a marketplace person, uh, really is just to follow, just to follow. And, and sometimes we we try to devise our own ways, right? We try to make sense of the whole thing. Uh, I've learned for myself that no good. Lah. Mm. 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 So for, from what I'm gathering that you're saying was that that shift was really mainly a leading from God. Um, mm-hmm. Was there any, was there any like positives or or certain practicalities or, or or pros that you saw could potentially happen in the house church as opposed to in a formal institutionalized program oriented kind of uh, mm. ministry setting that kind of drew you or was that something that you didn't you didn't really consider at that point of time it was just more like hey this is the idea that the holy spirit is kind of like incepted into me and now this is growing and brewing mm. that's a good question i think for me uh, i had no qualms about uh small church medium-sized church large church mm. mega church um to me it's just a means to what god wants to do mm. right and so um I think for me, the the desire the, or the passion rather has always been discipleship. Mm. And what I felt uh, happening more times than not in a corporate church setting is we spend so much time with programs, we spend so much time with uh, administrative work. Mm. And it's only natural because you've got more numbers, you've got more more things to, to look into yeah. because of the size of the group that you're yep. you're you're looking over. Mm. Um, but the appeal of um, a house church or a smaller church per se is that you focus less on all of these things because there's a smaller group of people and you actually get to do more tangible disciple making. Mm. And so I think that really resonated with the other passion that got placed in my heart um, as a pastor. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and the reason I, I I picked on that, or rather I picked out that out, um, was I think this kind of like uh, for some of you who who know me, you follow me for a little bit, and those are some of the questions that I I ask, you know, uh, that when you're so busy, um, because essentially when you're when you're a big church pastor, a lot of times the last thing you're doing is pastoring. <laughs> you know, you are you are organizing, you're coordinating, you're planning, you're leading, leading, and leading is not. Le- Leading, there is a form of pastoring involved in leading, but definitely uh, pastor, pastoring just doesn't just involve leadership, right? There's a lot yeah. of different things, journeying with people. And I think that was my experience as well. Um, when you're really, really packed and busy and just going all the time, sometimes 
I mean, journeying with people is, is tough. You know, journeying with people takes time. Um, and that's where I think for myself, I'm kind of with you. I, I don't really have the answer of is it big church, medium church, or small mm. church. But I do see that with a slower pace kind of um, ministry or, or, or spiritual communion, communal life, um, discipleship could potentially happen a lot more effectively compared to a big, busy, oriented um, kind of like program. Mm. But, um, but yeah, um, so I, I see like for us here, we've got the pull factor where you felt like, hey, God's leading you somewhere else. And then John, for you, it's like the push factor. Like it's like, ah, I didn't really want to, um, you know, just the way, the way things are going. And for me, it's a combination of both the push and, and pull factor. But I think all of us have that combination of push and pull factor. Um, what was some of the, and maybe I'll, I'll get John to speak on this a little bit first. What was some of the, I know this is going to be a very broad and big question and we can go like on and hours for it, but I'll just put it out anyway. What was some of like the biggest struggles or difficulties that you had, that you experienced as you transitioned out as uh, of that, or you, as you made a decision and transitioned out of full-time ministry? Uh, for me, it was... I, I didn't struggle as much because I I sort of lined up a job for me. Like mm. before I made that decision, I knew mm. that, you know, I, I, I had a friend who was hiring and uh, I got into my job. Mm. Uh, so we were already discussing about what yep. kind of help he needs. How, mm. what do I, what, what would I do when I join this company? So I didn't have that, that, uh, that first struggle with like, you know, sending out CVs and, um, finding a job post-church mm. work. I didn't have that struggle, which I think it's God's blessing. Mm. Um, so a lot of the struggle is really just a change in pace, you know. Mm. So like you said, at, at where my, my the, the church I was in, we were very focused on discipleship. Mm. So, um, so we, we get off at three, you know, three o'clock we clock out because from three onwards, you're supposed to go and meet people. Mm. You know, for real? So, oh, you yeah. mean for you? You leave the office at 3 p.m. Correct. Okay. Oh, yeah. wow, that's yeah. really good. Yeah, so so there was a huge focus on this. So you, if you go to the office, even like today, like if you go to the office, by the afternoon, or today got service, not today, Saturday, but on a weekday, at a certain time point, you're supposed to go and meet people. That's, that yeah. was a huge focus of the church. Mm. Uh, so uh, I I was also transitioning out of the youth pastor role and going to young adults role. I, I think I didn't do very a, a good job uh, as I was leaving, especially mm. with the young adults. Mm. Um, I, I just couldn't do it at that mm. point. But, yep. um, but I think going into a, a, a circular job, the, the struggle is very different. It's... When you when you're at when you're at church when you're working in church there's this amazing focus mm. there's a there's a direction to there's a person to point to mm. right we, we it's it's so easy for you to do that and I and when I started work I realized that you know everybody has their own north right mm. everybody has some reason why they're doing things mm, that's an interesting insight yep. and um and you're working with people who are not like you who don't share a common vision. Mm. So they they will look out for their own interests, mm. and you will look out for your own interests. Mm-hmm. And then how do you? So so at my job, I I, I do quite a bit of uh, maybe collaborations with people, and so a lot of times just finding a common vision, uh, find, finding a common goal. Both of us will succeed in this. Mm. And then when you realize that some people are just lack of a better term, some people are just snakes. Mm. Because, but it's because you came from an environment where all your colleagues share a common faith, share mm. a common vision, and now that you go to a different, that uh, different environment is, the mindset of everybody is different. Mm. You know, mm. um, yeah. So I had like the the harsh reality of that, right? Um, maybe not because I didn't know this before. It's me because you're so used to. Yeah, having to trust the person opposite you. Mm. Yeah, and I think because you, you've been you you were working before, and then you went into ministry for how long? For five or six years, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think when you are, some of these things it's not that you don't know, but it's just kind of like you're not accustomed to that reality anymore. Yeah, and suddenly yeah. like you're in there, and then it's like a shock to the system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you when you, and also like when you when you work in church, you you're working with people. 
it's an environment of faith, you know. Mm. Mm. It's it's people, the decisions people make. There's there's a lot of faith involved in it. Mm. Um, I think in in when you move to a a, a job like a secular job, um, the reality is you're in an environment of risk, because <laughs> mm. everybody is just balancing that risk. Mm. You know, uh, of if I make this decision, what's the risk? Mm. You know, what are the opportunities? Mm. And it's it's a whole different mindset altogether. Mm. When when we make decisions to go and disciple someone, to spend you know one day a week with a fourteen year old for the next six months, it's a it's a decision of faith. We a faith we put into a fourteen year old that they would uh, that God would touch their lives and God would help them and you mm. know. But in a workplace, it's about you know. What is the potential of this? How does this? What's the what's the ROI basically? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, I think you, that's spot on because um, I would say that the the working world one of the big differences between if I don't use spiritual sector, like I think non profit if you like to call it, or even to commercial, uh, that's the thing, right? Like in a commercial sector, you have to be very conscious of how your time is spent. Because I, I mean, as a pastor, you can go for like lunches that last two or three hours, all in the name of discipleship, right? But I think in the same way, <laughs> in, in a working environment, I mean, unless you're your own boss, uh, you really have then to justify why are you spending yeah. two or three hours with a, with a person. And that's, and that's a very subtle mind, mindset. Uh, not subtle, actually. It's a very big, it looks, like, it looks on the surface like a very small change, but it's actually a big mindset shift. Yeah, I had like uh, some of my some of you meet me for lunch and we used to do like two, three hours, no problem, right? Mm. 45 minutes in, then we had like, oh, we're going to have to ha- have a hard stop soon because I have to go back to work. You yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, it's different. Yeah. It's so different. Yeah. Yeah. Out of curiosity, when, so you, you and, um, when you made the decision to leave or not go back in your, in your case, what was the, um, what was the response or the reaction to the to the people around you, your leaders, the people you led? Were they surprised? Were they, yeah? Talk maybe talk us through that. How was that like for you? Actually, I didn't I didn't tell anybody why I left. Uh, I just had to leave mm. because I was in that point where if I were to go and tell people why I left, people mm. were left with me. Mm. Mm. And I grew up in a with the mindset that I I would uh, I would never leave it. Divided. I, w- I don't want to be the cause of division, mm. you know, because the church is already so divided already. I didn't want to be the cause of it. Mm. So, um, so pretty much when you when you left, that's when people found out you left. Did you, you didn't actually like tell like, preempt anybody or like even your leaders or any, anything like that? Uh, yeah, I didn't preempt them. Mm. I, mm. I I wasn't already. I wasn't functioning. I feel I wasn't effective okay. already. Yep. Yep. Uh, so. The next course would be to actually take myself out. Mm. Uh, if not, you'll be you just not that it will be uh, inefficient. It would have been detrimental if mm. I were to do that, lah. I in that's my in my opinion. I know yep. some of my some of my my ex leaders might not think the same way, but uh, and and they haven't asked me about it as well. Mm. Uh, God lah, you know. Remember that time there was this thing where it's really popular on. Instagram where you oh, ask the anonymous the questions. anonymous thing yeah Ooh, yeah well. that one was <laughs> <laughs> they went at it but uh yeah so I I didn't I didn't tell anybody because I feel that at that point if I did it I would have been I said more than I needed to say and 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 I had done that out of pure bitterness mm. or you know just to divide the church mm. you know? so I didn't want to do that yep. And I commend you for that, bro, because yeah. I, I think not many people realize this. I wouldn't make a very statement that sounds like blatantly obvious, but it's not uh, properly acknowledged, right? That pastors are also human beings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that we, we have like emotions, we have like uh, feelings, we have our own thoughts, you know, and uh, our own journey and our own battles that we, we go through. And it just sounds like you were really not in a good place. And yeah, and and it's it's odd for both the pastor and the people he's leading because the people that he's leading usually they look at the pastor as like you have you have it all together you are a man of God you're yeah. supposed to have it all together uh, because you are like supposedly closest to God I mean they don't say that but that's a subconscious belief I feel yeah. so the minute 
the parser displays any form of like sometimes vulnerability or human behavior, most people are quite kind of forgiving and they kind of just go, okay, they accept it, but they don't follow up on it. If you know what I mean, mm. like they, and that's my experience as well. Like people will go, okay, yeah, you, 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 you do what you do, but they don't reach, actually acknowledge that, hey, this is, this has a personal and deep and potentially even deep impact on who I am as a person. Um, leading and and I think one of the things that I was also really struggling throughout uh, the part the f- the final few years in in, in ministry maybe to uh, during the COVID period leading on empty mm. leading on empty hurts I don't know about what you guys by hurts yeah. where where you really feel like you're void of any form of um, inspiration but yet you have to turn up and inspire people where you we're going through different things and you got all these struggles and you you have to show up we, we were, were in COVID we were in the midst of COVID right so for those of you who didn't know uh, Malaysia was like strict lockdown no physical meeting and also all of it was like on Zoom and whatever so we had to like still show up and be there and, and all the, everyone's cameras would be off you know <laughs> and all we'd be speaking just to a black screen no, and, and we had to show empty up halls. Yeah, empty halls yeah and we, we would still show up and give it but yet we could be like dying on the inside and um and, and I think that what, that's what not many people don't realize. Yeah. And I think for the pastor himself, there's also, I guess, that sometimes that struggle is how much do I, how much can I let people in? Because I do need, I, I do want to give a bit of context. I do want to give them a bit of, I do want to share with them, but how much can they, or are they actually willing to understand? And I, I think that's probably yeah. a little bit in your experience, right? Because, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think, a lot of them tried lah. I, mm. I I don't want to sit here and say, oh, the church neglected me. Mm. They, they did try lah. Uh, but I just wasn't in that space. Yep. I was just pushing people away. Mm. Um, the, the, I think also at that point, right, you know, when there was COVID as well as the registration, there was this, I don't think, I think subconsciously, a lot of the leadership just wanted to be as normal as possible. Mm. And I think that usually is never the right path. Yeah. You, you got to acknowledge what is happening mm. and so, somehow help people navigate that. Mm. And um, So for your context, like, there was actually already a lot of like movements and shakings within the leadership, but yeah. everybody just tried to pretend like it wasn't happening. Like, I mean, they was knew it was like happening, that. but yeah. it's just the moment the, the cameras are on, right? It's like there's nothing happening, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But in reality, it was... Is struggle la. like the mm. moment we do a, a staff meeting or whatever, it's it's tough and, and it requires all these all these conversations with your leader, and, but you know uh, the leadership is so busy or they. Mm. I, I I remember during that time you know we were going through a deregistration, so there was a lot of politics happening and people would come up to me and ask me, you know, it's not my youth would come and ask me, oh, what's happening? I said I don't know, mm. and then they would turn around and say you purposely don't want to tell us. Mm. I was like, whoa, where's this coming from? Mm. Right? I'm literally Mr. Put your head down and do your work, you know? Mm. And and I'm like, you know, there's a reason why I stay away from these things because the moment I I look up and see all these things happening, right, and I get involved in it, I, I become, I, it, it changes me, right? Mm. And, and then, and it takes the focus away from what I'm actually supposed to do, mm. what mm. I'm called to do. Mm. You know, but they wanted to know, mm. you know, and so they would they would say you guys hid it from us, mm. and I think it's such a, it was it was really hurtful when that happened because I felt right that my job was to share. I'm a shepherd, mm. I protect my sheep from danger, and I saw danger, mm. so I I had to protect them lah. but they were in a position where it was leaking, mm. you know, and mm. and. They were, in my opinion, they were being defiled mm. because of other people's sin. Mm. So they started to have unforgiveness and they started to have bitterness. Wow. And I couldn't protect them from that. Yep. Yep. Because it was, you know, they, they, if they don't get it from me, they'll get it from someone else. Mm. Lah, mm. Right? And I, I really wanted to protect them. Mm. But uh, yeah, it, it reached a point where, you know, I'll, I'll go for AGM and I'll, I'll be like, 
Huh? Serious? Uh? AGMs, uh, man. Uh, those are always a joy. Uh, I don't know whether you guys have. We never had. One thing I appreciate about my old church is we never had AGMs. Uh, so like, praise the Lord for the that. Missed out the Praise the Lord on that. Yeah. But, um, AGMs. <laughs> where all the out of context scriptures come together. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're wondering what an AGM is, it's, it's like, um, uh, because if you're under the registrar of society, coming back to that, you have to have an AGM. That's yeah. actually compulsory. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's essentially a open meeting, open mic meeting. Anybody can turn up and just have That's the mic. So you're a member of the church. Yep. And say, you have you can say. have a go, say whatever you want, uh, bring up whatever issue you want, because that's yeah. your, your right. So, so John, it's for you, it sounds like, if I can just summarize it for you, your, your, your journey as a full-time minister, it was like, you tahan until you cannot tahan. <laughs> that's what, that's kind of what made you go. It's like you, yeah. you were just trying, because I picked up on that, you know, you are literally Mr. Put your head down and do your work. So you were just really trying your best to serve, to do people, um, not, not do people, <laughs> but to, to, to disciple people, to serve them. Yeah. Um, but then eventually it just came to a point where it was just not conducive anymore and you had to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's only so much you can take, right? Mm, mm, yeah, that's, yep. And I, I, just, I just want to pick up on something that we were talking about just now. Mm. And I think the, the humanistic uh, element of being a pastor, right? Mm. Um, I think we, what we were saying just now is that it's true that, that many times our congregation, our members, mm. the people that we're leading expect us to be next to God. Mm. And I think when we start to show signs of, of us being human, uh, they start to wonder, mm, no, you're not supposed to do that. Mm. I think one of the things that, that I was made aware of is that as I took time to really reflect after transitioning is that um, I think some of the examples that were shown uh, for us and, and to us kind of displayed that that it's not good. It's not good to show your vulnerability. It's not good to show your, your, your weaknesses. It's not good for you to, to um, take too many days off for your family or to take time off for yourself. Uh, but keep serving, you know, keep, keep showing up. Mm. I think that, that is the thing that many, I think, in our gen... Um, begin to, to, to ask ourselves deeper. And, and I, th I think that's, that's what makes us stand out in a way that we're willing to ask ourselves first. Then we begin to, to have that conversations among friends and say, something's not quite right. And something's got to give, right? You either give this part or you give the other part. And most of the times as pastors, the part that we give is often the part that we ought to put more attention in our personal lives, our family. I think we got the whole, that whole structure, that whole pyramid of what ministry or leadership is kind of like upside down. Mm. And so to me, as I was hearing, you know, the both of you speak, it just, it just clicked that, yeah, I think for us, we have had that, I would say that, that privilege to, to reflect deeper on what it really means to be a pastor, what it really means to be somebody that, that leads a group of people towards God in a wholesome, healthy way. Mm. And, and so much of what we have gone through in a corporate church setting or for any other setting for those who are viewing is that um, there has been that neglect of of um, how do we care for ourselves better? Uh, mm. How do we actually um, introduce that part of our humanistic side in a way that's acceptable to, to our congregation, to our members, to our followers? Mm. And I think that's something that, that, that we all are trying to speak about, mm. right? And so... I think that really has an appeal to many because as we individually talk to, to different ones, I think that's what I've been getting from, you know, like that, that's the kind of response or, or question or feedback that I've been getting from peers who are saying, yeah, why, why haven't we talked about that more? Yep. Until we, we have to be part of that so-called great resignation. Yep. Uh, in that aspect, I think there's definitely a big 
Great there is a There's three of us. Great, <laughs> 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 great Exodus, right? We, we should call it the Exodus if you if you want to be making more contextually appropriate, not a resonation, <laughs> but um, but in that aspect, I think there is definitely a generation, a very obvious generation gap because I remember um, towards the end when I spoke to an elder in my church about uh, you know that I feel that I'm leading on empty, I've got all these things going on. I feel like I probably need a break um, because at that point they were like pushing and they were like trying to set things up for the next successor already. And I was one of the candidates and that that guy just flat out told me and said that your capacity is not, not, not big enough. You mm. want to be senior pastor? No such thing, you know. Literally, those were like his words to me. And I think that was kind of like, we talk about push and pull factors, right? That was one of the elements that added to that push factor where I felt like, man, if I'm going to stay in this environment, or if I'm going to stay in this position, they were just going to push you till they can like, I don't know to, to, to what point. And, and at that point of time, for me, I was really reaching my, um, I did not realize it at, at first, but looking back, I think I was actually already past my limit. Mm. Um, and two moments in the last, like um, maybe, or two incidents in the, in, uh, so I, I left, I officially resigned in December, 2021, but I had to serve six months notice. Um, so in that period, one year leading from maybe mid of 2021 to mid of 2022, two incidences that really highlighted to me as I think back that I, I was really not in a good place was one, I actually, uh, I think we were in a senior senior leadership meeting, and after the senior leadership meeting, I told the I told the leaders, the two top senior leaders, I needed to have a chat with them, and I just broke down and cried. Once it was over Zoom, and the, everybody else had left, I just broke down and cried, and I think they were like, I mean, nobody knew what to respond. I didn't know what was going on. I just broke down and cried, but mm. I was like, I think a part of me was telling myself, you have to stop. Mm. You have to stop. But at that point in time, I couldn't because I just felt like I couldn't because again, sometimes pastors, you're plagued with this, I don't know, savior complex where you got to feel like, no, I got to keep the ministry going. No, yeah. I got to I gotta keep them encouraged. I got to keep them going. I got to, but I just, so what happened well, I, after that, I dried off my tears, went to bed, next day, turned up again. Mm. That was the first incident. The second incident I remember was um, during that, tr that so-called garden leave or transitioning period where there was a lot again of a lot of, a lot of confusion, like what's happening, who's going where, is there, is there going to be a new church, is there going to be a new ministry, and all that. And I'm not, I'm not proud of this, but I actually went off at one of um, the girls who've been serving in my ministry for a long, long time, because I just felt like, because at, at the moment there was a lot of, there was just a lot of maneuvering, um, even without my knowledge. And I think this poor girl, she, she went and she did a few things out of good intention, but I was, I was not angry at her. I was just angry at how the whole situation was panning up because I thought like, hey, we could, we could just, you know, because my desire was that we transitioned out. And again, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, but when I started um, Center Church, which I ran for a short while, my desire was not to compete with all the other churches out there, you know, like the Kingdom Cities or the Hill Songs or the big churches, whatever. You know, I was not going trying to be another big church. I was actually wanting to try a different model. But the response that I got was that um, I was like some guy who was, you know, being disloyal and betraying. And uh, so there was a lot of things going on. So I was just so angry at that. And man, I went off at this, uh, like I went off at her. I remember it was a Chinese New Year. So I picked up the phone and I just gave it to her. And then um, we, 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 we patched up a little bit after that, but I don't think it's the same anymore. Um, but those were two moments. So which leads me to my next question. Like, were there, was there a moment, if you guys are op open to share, uh, it may not be as dramatic as mine, that's fine, right? But were there moments in your life throughout, just leading up or just within that journey where you felt like, man, I, I just, something's not right and I got to stop or, hey, I'm, I'm, not, in a good, I'm not in a good place. Hmm. I think for me it was it was my health. Mm. Yeah. I think it, it really wow. took a toll on me because of that drive. 
mm. right? Because you keep wanting to show up. And I think that that aspect of being next to perfect, you just want to keep going. And and so I realized that that from, because what I did after coming out from, from um, business was, I went into Bible college and at the same time, I worked full-time in the church. Mm. And so I completed uh, one degree and one diploma within the span of uh, almost four years, four and a half years while working, while wow. being full-on in in whatever I was doing. And I, th- I thought I could take it, you know. I thought, okay, let's push it, you know, and let's get that done and then let's continue on. And then once I got done with that and then I went in, continued on with my my full-time work in the church, I realized that, that one, I wasn't taking care of my health. Mm. Two, I was uh, having too many late nights. Um, needless to say, it took a toll on my family as well because um, family came honestly second, mm. you know. Um, and then what happened next was that I felt my body deteriorating. Literally, I felt sick. I felt, you know, and I had uh, a major medical problem which I shared on my website uh, just a couple months back. Um, and and that escalated and, and that really scared me. Wow. Because I felt that what am I giving that is making me feeling so crippled and, and you know, mm. I don't want to use the word death, but but it feels like I was dying because, Whoa. because, because I was just keep, I, I just kept on that momentum. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and to me, that was something that I really had to reevaluate. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, I, I don't know. I mean, for some of us who are listening in, I, I want to say to us that, you know, there, there is a balance to what we are, what we are doing and, mm. and you don't have to sacrifice everything. You're called to be obedient, but you're not called to sacrifice. Mm. I think that's a call that, that, that all of us need to be keenly aware of that. Uh, what are we giving in exchange that perhaps may not be God's best or God's plan for for the call mm. that He's given us? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I also I was just looking at some uh, the other day. I saw like you know when you doom scrolling right, and then it's like this statistic that our generation spends like five to six times more with our children than our parents' generation. Mm. You know, I think I think if. You know, I know I'm jumping a couple of questions ahead, but you know, if if people are running churches today and you are in a position to make decisions, right? Yeah. There, there has to be a very key understanding. Is that oh yeah. This yeah. generation of and the new generation of pastors that are coming in, they're yeah. going to spend a lot more time with their children, because you know, and and I I feel incredibly privileged to be able to do these things because mm. I know my parents' generation, it wasn't a choice; they they had to make a living. Mm. You know? So, but this generation, we can make those choices. And I think inside, we, we feel that, that need to, to spend that time maybe because we didn't have it with our parents. Uh, but I, I also remember when I was in Bible school, uh, I was talking to uh, uh, someone, one of my classmates, and he also went into full-time ministry. And uh, he said the shocking thing about going to full-time ministry is not the money, you know. It's not the, 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 the drop in pay that you get. It's not that. It's the amount of time you actually have to put in. Mm. you realize that there's no clocking out yeah mm. yeah that's you know? true so although I, I clock out at 3 o'clock and I'm supposed to meet people mm. but that is just for regulations just so that we don't break any laws we work all the time yeah, yeah. Right? there's prayer meeting or there's a watch night service or you know there's a 24 hour bible reading no I think okay. even beyond just those highlight events yeah. you're, you're just on meant call. to be on call yeah Mm. And and you kind of like, you know, made to made to accept the fact that you don't turn off your phone, mm. and so yeah, yeah, I completely. Yeah, or, or when you do set boundaries for yourself, people challenge that. Mm. You know, people get get uh get get you know people will would say, um, 
they, they may not outrightly challenge it, but they may, they kind of like come from the other angle. They go like, hey, you know, but didn't God call you to shepherd? Hey, isn't this the price of the of the calling? You know, they, they kind of like, you know, no, they, they use this sort of like yeah. languaging um, and whether rightly or, or wrongly, but mm. yeah, there's that expectation. And I, and I agree with you. Uh, I think one of the, Say one of the sayings that that um that I read. I don't know whether I read it somewhere or heard it, but it just stuck with me. And this was way back. So this was like even before I became a father. Um, there's this saying right where it goes that every church will always have a pastor, every business will always have a CEO, or every ministry will always have a leader. But your wife should only ever have one husband, and your children will only mm-hmm. ever have one father. Yeah, and. And yeah, I'm 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 with you on, on on that. And I think that was also one of the things that I realized that hey, if I were to keep running, because you know, one of the things that was told to me, um, and I'm an open book, okay, so I'll say like I'll say I'll, I'll I'll say 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 as it is. But one of the things that was told to me that if you wanted to be the like you know a past a top pastor or senior pastor in this church, um, you have to attend all of the meetings. You will have to go for all of the services and get this. This was not said just to me. This was said to my wife and I. And the exact words I remember is that say to my wife, I'm sorry, uh, you had to give your husband to the church. That's the price of the calling. And I think it was at that point where I think I already mentally 90%, not 90, let me be 60% checked out. Mm. I go, whoa. You know what? Quiet quit already. Yeah, point. this is not. A, I think that's when I started plotting already. I go, mm, okay, what can I do next? You know, <laughs> uh, if I plot, if I started a church, who will follow me? You know, that kind of, that's when I started actually seriously thinking about that because there was just that yeah that 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 constant push. I don't know what it is that motivation. Maybe it's just a, a generational thing where. Um, but I I don't see how that model has has, has worked. You know? Yeah. Mm. Things but, just work so differently but, now. But I do want to say this as well. I think because we, uh, I do want to make sure that we also honour those people that we stand on their shoulders as well. To also say that it, it's not everyone that's like that. Yeah, mm. of course. It's not everyone that, that puts that kind of uh, pressure on us. There are those that that understand. There are yeah. those that, yeah. that say it's yeah. okay. Um, and, and I think each of us have been very blessed to have good core teams, good people who were our our right hand, left hand man, who are our armor bearers and, and journey alongside with us that also provided that kind of space for us to also be ourselves and also to be human and also to, to show our vulnerabilities. But I think we're talking something about something very systemic, something that is accepted as the norm. And, and I'm thankful that I wasn't told something like that to me because mm. I would have flipped. It, it's just, no way, man. I'm not going to accept that as a yeah. fact. Yeah. And I think sometimes people forget that when you're like, so with my, with that, with that in that situation, the people in the room who were all telling me this, their kids were all grown up. Mm. You know, like their kids were already like, what? In their, they're all they're full grown adults with jobs, you know, but I think sometimes we, we, we lack empathy. Because mm. what is empathy? Empathy is, Sympathy is I feel for you. Empathy is I feel as you. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest problems um, when we talk about generations, both sides, right? Yeah. Where we, we don't actually put ourselves in the person's shoes and go like, hey, you know, this is actually uh, different. So I agree with you that mm. while there were, while there are people, m- most of the part, uh, people are very understanding. Yeah. But certainly for my, my situation, uh, I felt like, for the most part, yes, people are understanding until there is a, a requirement or a need. Mm. There's a conference coming up. There is a decision that needs to be made. Then all the all the languaging come up already. Oh, you know, you you want to, you you need to have more capacity. You you know, you know, maybe your prayer life is not strong enough. That's why you don't have wells to draw from. You know that kind of thing. Like where you <laughs> like, they may not actually say it. Yeah, yeah. But, actually, but they don't say it. But it, it, it makes yeah. The, but the the things that they it's expected they, out they, of you is they kind of like imply and like it makes you feel that way. I, that, I I didn't get any of that. You know, I, although I said that, you know, mm. but I I said that just because the, I I want you know whoever is listening, if you're mm. if you're in a position to make decisions yep. for your yep. for your church, mm. that's something you need to be mindful of. Yeah. Especially if you, 
if you're wondering why my next generation keeps quitting, you know, you have to be very conscious that it's like the meme, lah, right? You know those the boomers complain about the, the this generation is lazy and everything. Then they show you the living cost that has changed and everything. It just feels a little bit out of touch mm. with what this generation is facing in terms of how their lifestyle is like mm. and how how they balance family. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, and I, I agree with you. Uh, coming back to the point as well, I agree with you, uh, David. Where it's not that what they did was wrong, mm. right? And I think I'm grateful for the price that they paid. Again, yeah. we are standing on platform. We were standing on platforms that we ourselves did not build. Yeah, but times are changing, things are shifting, and I think there's so much. Uh, there is so much more need now for discipleship in the home. I don't even just no, let's let's not even talk about just discipleship in the home. Let's talk about uh, par- proper parenting because back then, yeah. um, again, not that it was not proper, but back then the biggest need for parenting is provision. Yeah, right. You got to put food on the table. You got to build a future. In this day and age, not that that has gone away, but there is definitely a great shift where there needs to be more molding and shaping mm. of a child's personality, character, and even like appetites, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but when I was a youth pastor, the amount of young people that told me that they were exposed to pornography below the age of seven was off the roof. (laughs) And it's a situation of like, oh, you know, somebody's sibling would like come and like, and and dude, when I talk to like kids, right? They already have so much knowledge, like, knowledge of sexuality um, not just sexual acts but sexuality and they have all this information right that they're processing but I think you guys can agree that just because you have a, no- a lot of knowledge it doesn't mean you have wisdom mm. because wisdom is actually knowing what to do with that knowledge and I think we that's what that's the the, the endemic issue right now with our the next generation they are going to be growing up in a world where you cannot stop the information coming at them and, and going after them. But there is a lot there, but what you what you can do, what you need to do is actually journey with them, spend time with them, help them process some of these mm-hmm. things. Um, I don't know what, what is it like in Malaysia, but you know, when I look at like uh, reports of like how many Gen Zs, uh, many, many people in Gen Zs are actually losing religious affiliation or they're just leaving churches. One of the big reasons is because I'll put it, as simple as I can, right, is that the church just doesn't have any intelligent answers. <laughs> you know? I can tell you, if I, I can count, um, or, or rather I cannot keep track of the amount of people who I've met where they have a negative experience with church. And one of the, as quite often or quite common is because when they went for a youth meeting or when they went for some kind of meeting and they had a, a, a question, the answer was always, you need to have more faith because the Bible said so, um, just trust and don't think so much. <laughs> you know, or you're thinking, I've said a or you think, or, or you think, <laughs> yeah, maybe or three you, or four, <laughs> just three or four. Okay. Just three yeah. or four. That's just the card that you, one of the first few cards that you play. I, I mean, I mean, the reality is, pastors. Not all pastors have answers. Though. Yeah, and not all pastors are properly equipped. I would say this to actually do discipleship. They they may be equipped to. And that's again, that's another topic altogether, right? Yeah. What, what does a modern day pastor look like? Because it's not just about uh, being able to preach anymore. It's, you got to have like all yeah. these sort of different skills. But but, I, but coming back to the issue at hand, I think that's where I, I like the shift needs to happen, right? Where it's, the church cannot just be a place of gathering. It needs to be a place of equipping and sending as well, yeah. where we're equipping people to actually journey with because uh, I think that's, that's the thing uh, that's the thing I always tell parents you know when I was a youth pastor the amount of times that a parent would, would come to me with their problem with, with their child and it's like real like crazy you know a lot of issues and everything and they go please fix it and I'm like how? <laughs> like why? what? what can I do? Yeah. right because a, you know, a child or anybody at best they would spend two three times a week at church uh, but for the m- most of the time they're at home with you so Discipleship, spiritual formation, worship, all these things really starts at home. Uh, yeah. And something that I, I'll be really honest, I did all the institutionalized ministry stuff well. I, I kicked butt at it, in fact, I would say. Mm. But doing that, all mm. those things at home, yeah. man, 
it's a different ball game altogether. Yeah, my wife was just telling me about yeah. this, you know, how how I how I how I interact with my my elder son and mm. you know, since since COVID and since we, we left church, you know, my son has you know, a lot of things have changed for him. He's not used to going to church, he's not used to mm. worship. So now it's just kick starting back that back mm. up again, like just mm. restoring all these things. It's tough. Mm. It's tough. Like, like, you know, back when I was a youth pastor, when some, a parent came to me and told me about this, I was like, I wasn't very empath- <laughs> empathetic about it, like, right? I was yeah. like, it's your fault. <laughs> and now Just I'm bring like, him to church more, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then know. now it's like, it's my fault, like, right? And, yep. and there's no real, there's no real solution outside of really putting that time and mm. love and mm. being very intentional with your children. Yeah, but it's tough. It's really tough. So you, know, you come back from work, you're tired. You have like thirty minutes before they have their bedtime, you know. Mm. And that thirty minutes, you wanna you know, eat dinner. You have to squeeze all these things in there, read a bedtime story, put them to bed, and that's if there's no drama that night, you know. Mm, mm. It's tough. Parenting is difficult. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Parenting is difficult. Spiritual parenting. I don't know what category to put that in there. <laughs> you know, parenting your kids with spiritual principles and impart inculcating. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. Some days I'm just like, dude. As long as you guys grow up to be decent human beings, yeah, I think yeah. I done my job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let don't don't talk about all this like other stuff, right? So yeah, it's just yeah. like, man, that's just a, a huge huge thing. And so we we're going on the topic. We're going on a, on a trend here and a topic here. Maybe I'll ask this question then. Um, what was the impact? like for you guys uh, in both sense personally and family um, wise when you when you left ministry what was the impact uh, maybe before that let me backtrack a little bit you guys are not uh, not in the same church where you you um, you served right no, no not, not anymore right no. so I, I had a few people ask me this question uh, is it possible in your opinion to actually stay in the same church uh, when you stop working as a full-time mm. pastor? Is it is it possible? Or, wh- or why was it not possible for you guys? Mm. Maybe that's a better question. I think I've seen some friends who have uh, moved on or transitioned out from full-time church mm. work mm-hmm. and they still attend their home church. Mm. Um, I've seen some that could not. Mm. Uh, I think I come down to the point of maturity i think if 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 the congregation is able maturity of the congregation yeah, okay. maturity of the congregation that's one if they're able to see that pastor just as a worshiper as they are then that's great but if they are going to be awkward about it if they they keep going to ask questions about the past or you know a lot of why questions i think that's going to make it difficult not just for the pastor but it's just going to make it difficult for a congregation as well. Uh, as for myself, um, I think for me, once I transitioned out from my, my home church, um, there was a point where I did miss my church. Mm. Uh, I did want to come back and, of course, see uh, the young people, the see the uncles and aunties in the church. Um, and so I thought, mm, perhaps I, I'll come back uh, because I, I came out August and and somehow or other in the whole pandemic situation, uh, we were allowed to meet in December for Christmas. Mm. And so I did come back. I, I came back for Christmas and uh, I took the seat way back <laughs> just so nobody would see us. Nobody would just, you know, we won't make an entry just to be very quiet. Um, but then, you know, the, the thing is that that you you can't, detach that 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 personhood mm. of yours right as a pastor as a person and and people come up to you and they still give you the acknowledgement they still seek for your pastoral uh, input into things and when I had a couple of those interactions during that Christmas service I felt mm, I think it's better for me to just stay away I think I'm gonna make it hard for them and yeah. also for me yeah so I just had to embrace that real moment and just say, uh, as much as I'm going to pursue whatever God will reveal to me in time to come about my next ministry assignment, I think I need to look for another local church. Mm. Um, mm. And yep. and I had to take a step back 
not just looking at myself, but f- at my family, like what we're mm. talking about. Because, um, you know, I, I, I'm not a PK, I'm not a pastor's kid. But having ministered to pastor's kid before, uh, I, can, I can feel somewhat the, the challenge that they go through. And me and my wife spoke about it, you know, and we said that I think this is not what we want for our son. You know, to have all of this pressure put on him, to have all these questions being asked at him when he has no no parameter of you know what what we do. You know, they, they grew up seeing us doing all these things, but do they actually know? No, they don't. Yeah. It's just yep. oh daddy's going here, you know, daddy is talking on that stage, you know, daddy's meeting a lot of people after lunch, you know, this and that. Yeah. And sometimes kids need to be kids because yeah. like, you know, you, you, kids go through naughty phases, right? And I've also seen um, situations where, you know, a kid would be doing stuff at like, uh, at like, you know, children's ministry or at youth. And then people will go, hey, aren't you the pastor's kid? Yeah. And that, that has an effect as well, you know? Yeah. Sometimes a kid is just being a kid <laughs> or he yeah, has room so, to be a kid. And so yeah. I think that was something that, that we needed to just take a hard look on and say, mm. I think it's better this way. It's better mm. that we just take some, some time off and I think the pandemic was a good cooling period for us. Mm. You know, we, we just viewed um, services online and then we just prayed. We just asked God, God, you just show us, you know, mm. where we should go uh, and then we'll just follow. And so, yeah, I, I really took that into consideration uh, and I think it, it did not just me but my family well. Mm, mm. Well, John, I mean, for, for you, uh, sorry, d- thanks for, for that, David. Um, but John, for you, I think it's pretty self-explanatory if you've been following up at this point why you had to leave. But what are your thoughts then? Is it actually possible in any different situations? I or think what COVID, are some things COVID made it a bit easier. Yeah. Because uh, we we're not meeting anyway. Yeah. So it's just, you know, yeah. flip to plan shakers. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? yeah. you know, everything was on YouTube. Yeah. And uh, when you put up the screen, uh, you can see all, of, all the churches are live at the moment. <laughs> you know, all at the same time. Yeah. It was so easy, Yeah. you know, to, to, to just move. But I think for my wife and I, it was uh, very much... Um, I remember we had a conversation and I told her that I think I'm going to leave church. Wow. And, and she was like, you know, where you go, I'll support you. And yeah, so I, I we left. Good wife is such an asset, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's, it's really difficult mm. because she did it because she's my wife, lah, right? And mm. she knows this is a place of hurt for me and I need to go. So she follows me. Wow. But when we left, right, we were just trying to find back the same church culture. <laughs> Mm. You know, I remember I was talking to to, to my boss, who's also a Christian, and I was telling him, you know, you know, go, we try so many churches already, right? And then you take all the all the criteria, uh, like that you like in a church, right? Then you look at it, ah, oh, man, I'd go back to my old church, <laughs> <laughs> right? And and you're like, it's 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 it's, it's strange, la, you know? And and as pastors, right, we it used to be our vocation, no? We walk into a service, uh, we are like. Not judgmental, la, but we have... You're yeah, viewing everything with a different lens. Yeah. Very yes. different. I'm yes. seeing like yeah. the sound man running from the back to the front. I'm seeing the usher being not shaking hand properly. I'm seeing all these things. No? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm, sitting, I'm standing there and all you're trying to do is just focus to be a worshipper, mm. right? But you just can't help it because yeah, this yeah. is what you used to do. You mm. step into a service when, you, when you're serving, right? And you see everything and you, you protect and you cover all the mistakes, right? That's what, that was our job. So now that now that we are in this new environment, that was the natural thing you did. I remember like the first time you went to physical church, then this church had a bear, like a mascot. Mm. And my younger son, right, COVID baby, who had never been to church before, you see the bear, wow, straight up worship the bear. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> then I was like, okay. <laughs> you know? and, 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 and like, you know, you just go from church to church and you notice all these things and you, yeah. And and I remember there was one church that we were really like going to jive in, but I always felt like something's off, like, you know, this is just not the place I want to be in. Something's making it uncomfortable. Then and she, and I, deep down inside I know maybe I'm judgmental, like, maybe mm, I'm just mm. you know, maybe I'm just being difficult. Maybe I just want to hop more churches. Mm. Right. And then 
And then uh, one Sunday, my parents and my sister came. And my sister came back from Singapore and we attend church. And she told me the same thing. No, and I was like, okay, mm. la, this is not me, okay, mm. la, right? Mm. So I decided to, to move in. But I think it's actually a lot more linear than, than, than that should be. La. I think it's also because we, me, my family were struggling to do it. It's COVID. It's such a convenient excuse not to go to church. No. Super convenient. Wow, well, already got people with disease, la, you know. And, <laughs> and it's mm. so easy. It's like it's and then and then it was like one of those kicks where you, you just decided, you know, I just need to attend church. Yep. You know? And and there's no church that's perfect, like just attend church. And big or small, whatever. So we we're, we're attending a, yep. a a church that's a bit a lot smaller than my previous church. You know, we're yep. enjoying ourselves there and service is great. Yeah. And and you know, yeah. I remember like attending there the the first week and I was like, oh, this is nice. It has very familiar vibes and some people from my old church moved to that church. So it's not like you're going to a place where it's everybody strangers. Mm. Then by the second time I attend, we were like, this is this is home. Yeah. You just got to commit yourself to mm. home. And I, I used to tell people that, right? You just got to just root yourself and you'll be and you'll be fine, no? But when you actually have to do it, you realize, wow, this oh, is yeah. Real, man. Yeah, where you actually start to, you actually start live, practicing your own preaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're yeah. actually the, the, the newcomer, right? Yeah, if you yeah. follow it, you start <laughs> listening to your own advice. It's like, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say that um, because the question, uh, I, mean, I appreciate both your input, but the question really was, is it possible to stay in your church? I think the, the, the answer is it depends, right? Yeah. It really depends because like for me, it was, I felt it was not possible simply because there was just too much expectation. Like the expectation, of course I was quite high profile. So it, it was going to be very hard to detach from that profile, right? Even when I meet other people outside now, old members of the church and they call me like Pastor John. I always just say, no, it's just John. And I was at a wedding recently and you know, they were like, no, once a pastor, always a pastor. I'm like, is that a death sentence? <laughs> but, they, but they actually said that, right? Um, but I, I think you also brought up a very pertinent point where it's, if you're trying to, because suddenly, sometimes figuring out what's next is not a straightforward process. Mm, it's not. It's not, right? Because you're not just figuring out what's next for you professionally, but you're figuring out what's next for your family, as you mentioned, going, and, and what's just next for your whole life. There's just so many elements and nuances to it that sometimes being in the same familiar environment may not be conducive. Unless it's a very straightforward thing where, no, I want to stop serving uh, or I want to stop working in church because I want to work outside now, but I want, I'm going to stay here. Mm. But when we talk about a shifting of values, a changing of uh, a adjustment of vision or just these different things, right? Sometimes it's just circumstances just do not allow you mm. or it's not the most conducive for you to remain. It's like when people break up, right? We always tell them, hey, you, you know how like people, we were, well, they had this situation where they were, when we counsel young people, they break up and then they're still friends and they go around the cycle for like, don't know how many mm. donkey years, right? So they're on, off, on, off, on, off. Why? Because they, they didn't have that proper, proper like separation from one another mm. to kind of process what happened within themselves and then what and then only later process because like it or not I read this somewhere that a lot of things that happen to us it's not just like um, it's physiological it doesn't just affect us mentally but it's, it affects us in our body also. Mm -hmm. so of the physical environment can actually be triggers why is PTSD a thing because if something happened to you in a certain place or a certain image uh, you attach a certain memory to a certain image and it triggers you why? Because it, it affects. Mm. Um, uh, and I think when we are transitioning out, there's a, a lot of things going on within us, which I agree, sometimes you, you need to be in a different environment to help yourself process. Because in that process, you could be led back to the, to the, old, to the same place, which is fine, right? Yeah. But even as you move out, I think what you're saying is true I, as well. I, I did try, you know, I did try. I stayed mm. for a while. I, I was like, you know, I'm just a regular member. I told the, the, mm. my pastor then, you know, if you need my help, I'm ready. Mm. I can mm. preach. I can I can work part time when I'm ready. That never came. That, mm. that, that opportunity never came. I was like, you know, I'm still a member of the church. I'm ready mm. to cast my vote. Come on, now I get to hold the mic because back then staff cannot cannot vote. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready, and now I have a vote. You know? AGM, right? <laughs> okay, now. Yeah. <laughs> now I get to be on the other side. Yeah, right. Uh, so, yeah. but I I didn't. Also, I remember deciding that right on the last day that I was like. I'm not gonna vote. I'm not gonna turn AGM, and 
um, I think it was after the AGM that I decided uh, I need to leave. And I also gave up my membership of, mm. at the church because I felt that uh, it was too tempting to mm. to be able to attend AGM and tell people how I feel, you know? Mm. I, I, I remember like before the AGM, right, I was like getting... F- <laughs> you, you imagine, no, I'm going to take the mind, I'm going to say all this, la, you really you gotta get it, you know? And yeah, I, I, I'm so glad that, that you know, even, even no matter how how much you struggle and how much you're wrestling, right? Sometimes the Holy Spirit is just like, don't do this, John. <laughs> you know, just, just sometimes just, just a you're, slight prompt, you know? You're a good man because <laughs> if the Holy Spirit, if sometimes I get, this is my weakness, if I get so riled up and I hear the Holy Spirit, don't, tell, don't do this, John, I'll be like, no, I'm still going to do yeah. it. <laughs> you know, just, but, but, um, but yeah, I, I think you, you, you mentioned also as you, as you transition out, you find a different place. You got to give yourself and your family time, yeah. right? It, it's a process, uh, l- looking for different places, and it's it's tiring, right? Mm. But but it, it it is it is a process, and I'm I'm glad that um you know your family and you have found a place, and I think yeah, David, uh, I think we all have like different communities that we are mm. we are part of now, and I, that's so important, isn't it? Yeah. Um, because I've also known of people who not just left full time ministry as pastors, but even just left ministry as leaders, as volunteers, mm-hmm. and then they just they don't just go to, done. they just don't go to church anymore. Yeah. Sometimes you need that space. I, 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 yeah. I agree. I, I, and I give that, but I find that um, it's, it's always good to, 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 to remain connected and to, to be plugged into a community. And I'm not just saying this as a pastor, because I'm not really a pastor anymore anyway, but I, I find that if I don't have that community, actually, I think I can, doesn't matter whether I've been ministry for 10, 15, 20 years, I think I can very quickly, you know, go the other direction because yeah. there's just so much pressure and even temptation now. I don't know whether you guys feel this, but now that you're not a pastor anymore, right? The lure of temptation is a lot stronger because yeah. now you're like, hey, I don't need to, like, let, let's, I'm going to be very crude and just put it like, you know, if I, if I actually went out and had an affair, it's not going to affect me professionally. Mm. Because it's not my, it's not, it's not tied sure. to my profession. Yeah. If I actually said something, or I made somebody you know angry or whatever, like it's not going to affect me yeah. professionally because whatever, right? I'm just going to be like everybody else, and that, that is, but but that the thing where it always be, John, are you still a Christian? <laughs> it's like you know that that Holy the Holy Spirit reminding me, and then being in that community actually really helps that. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Yeah. What well, you got? You, you guys are looking. You guys are not. You guys are like no, turning. Thinking, no, you, know? you guys are turning away from mm. me. It's like, hmm. What wow, this John yeah. Gunn really got problem? <laughs> yeah, too honest. Like, like I said just now, it's like really is you. You go from an environment of faith to an environment where everything oh, yeah. goes uh, It's yeah. the wild west out there, and yep. you can yep. do whatever you want. And yeah, you know, back then I was like pure abstinence. I mm. practice. I, so I, I, theologically, I, I, I'm okay with drinking. It's just mm. that. I, I and I have certain stances that I have mm. and I practice abstinence out of obedience. And abstinence from from alcohol, oh. okay. Because abstinence, I was thinking about something else. I was like, I should have said I was, that I was just like, in case. I was like, know? what? So now you allow and <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so now, yeah. I think I, was, I work in a restaurant. You know. Mm. Mm. So it's 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 very easy, mm. so much easier, mm. and and yeah, being in a community really does help. Like mm. just just knowing that you're a part of me. And, and, it's th- and, and I, I used to be, because in my home church, we had so many youth pastors come through our lives and leave. And sometimes you, you feel like, hey, why this person don't be Christian anymore? And you, you just never understood it. And I, it was a real struggle for me. Mm. Like, until I decided, okay, I, I need to root or else I'm, I'm gone. Mm. You know, at that point, right, I was like, yeah, I was. I, I I honestly think that I I wouldn't. Uh, I was I wasn't considering myself a Christian at a certain point. Wow. So I was. Mm. I'm done with this. Mm. Like, you know. And the worst part was, it was during that time, right, where all the church scandals were happening at the same time, you know. <laughs> oh, and that yeah, doesn't yeah, help yeah. at all. I'm yeah. like, oh, these jokers and these jokers, right? And this yeah. guy. <laughs> you yeah. know, and and, I mean, and well, there were so many, right? There was Ravi Zacharias, yeah. there was Carl Lenz. Then there was like that, song. Uh, there was the Jerry Farrell guy from um, I don't know if you guys know about this, but like one of the top 
university, one of the top Christian universities yeah, in the yeah, US. Yeah, Liberty so like, University. Yes, one, right? so, so there's just so many of them all happening at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, then you like, you know, then, then you get friends who post like, you know, this prophet is, this prophet is, and you're watching it like, what kind of junk is this, right? And you're, at a certain point, you're like, you know, I really cannot tahan these guys are, mm. you know? Really cannot tahan. I, I, at a certain point, when I was like, you know, I, I want to pick up on that, John, because I, I mean, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing. Um, I want to pick up on that because it's like we know that the church is not God. Yeah, we know it, but yeah. sometimes we can't help but feel that what what things that the church or Christians do to us, and we we equate it to. God doing it to us now. I know. I know. It sounds a very simplistic explanation, yeah. but yeah, when we get angry at Christians, or we get angry at the church, we can't help but feel angry at God as well. Yeah. Um. And I think it's natural, right? Because I think being on the other side now, like you mentioned before, as a pastor, we always tell people that when they have church hurts, right? Hey, this is not God didn't do this to you. Yeah. But now, when you're on the other side, you feel that it's not so straightforward. There's a complexity and web yeah. cobweb of emotions. So, how did you get past that then? Where? It was a huge navigation, I think. At first, because I was upset at a lot of people, mm. <laughs> right? So because you're upset at a lot of people, right, you you can't tell who you're more upset at and you can't tell where it actually originated from because mm. all these things happen at the same time, right? So mm. a lot of times I was... Uh, so I uh, literally did process elimination. Am I upset at this person? <laughs> no, I forgive, whatever. All right, we're done. Am I upset at this person or this party? No, I'm not upset, you know. And after you boil everything down, you realize that the root of it is that you, you're really just angry at God because uh, six years ago, seven years ago, when he called you into ministry, there was this vision, there was this promise. And then oh, yeah. overnight, you, you have no way at that point to see whether you can reach those promises, mm. you know. And... Yeah, I I would I really struggle with that. Like I, I remember there was a time where I said I, I was my wife was my I, I and I think I really thank God for my wife because she always can sense when I'm bitter. Mm. You know? Then she'd be like, I think you need to go see someone. You, know? mm. <laughs> you need to go and do something about this. Because cousin is live with this, right? So I remember like this one time I was like, Okay, I'm done being angry at church. I'm just gonna you know, so I, I met with the elders that used to oversee me and I told them and then I met with the current pastor of the church and oh wow them, mm. yeah. so mm. just just to 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 say you're sorry and, and and to ask for forgiveness and to forgive yeah that was that's a big deal for me and and that's why I can talk about it like actually you know before you called called me to do this right I was I was still like hesitating mainly because it was only a very recent thing that I I, I mm. let go Previously, I wouldn't tell anybody. Anybody. Like, remember I told you, I, I said just now that I told nobody about why I left church. Mm. It was a, a true fact. Mm. Nobody. I didn't tell my leaders, I didn't tell anybody. Mm. Everybody who, who knows a little bit will have got a little bit of a lie. Mm. Uh, or, or a white truth. Or, or a half truth. Half truth. Yep. You know, you'll get mm. half truth here and if all of them come together and have an AGM, they'll figure out the truth. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. So so it was like a, it was, it was a navigation that that oh I, I don't think it's navigating. I think it's wrestling. You really have to wrestle with God. Yeah. Uh, and and I remember it was just a couple of weeks ago that, I I was I was still so upset at God uh, that that that. Uh, his plans, or at least what I thought was his plans, or was it my plan? I don't know. But that what he had for me is gone. Mm. Mm. It's gone. Like you almost felt like tricked or conned, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I gave yeah. up my my best for nothing. Uh. Mm. Right? There was a huge there was a huge conversation I had with God. Mm. Like, you you tell me don't give my crumbs, so I give you my best. Then when I give you my best, what do I get? I get betrayal, I get, you know, disappointment, I get all these things. And I know I saw no way out of it. Uh. And I can say this now today because of a service a couple of weeks ago. You know, mm. and remember, uh, we were having a chat on one side, and I said, "Now I can say." Mm. Yeah. But when we had a chat a couple of months ago, before we had this, when you first asked us to join this, I said I had no clue, mm. right? But now, now I can say that you know, uh, God's plans are, are, are 
when if it's God's plan, then you know it will work. Mm. You know, even if it's true suffering, even if mm. it's true disappointment, even through all these things, right? His plan will work. Mm. And I appreciate and I honor and I thank you for for being so vulnerable and even actually willing to to share. And uh, I I guess I just am very uh, I'm very curious, uh, wanting to know about this. What what kept you holding on? Because it almost sounds like it would have just been easier to just walk away from everything. And if you walked away from everything, you probably would justif- you, you would have been justified or so, you know, to do that. Just like how, as I see it now, many people who walked away from it, they have very good reasons to do so. But for you personally, what kept you from doing that? What kept you holding on? Wrestling. I think, I think my wife really helped. Um, mm. Cause she did, she didn't feel the same hurt as me. Mm. Even though we're in the same situation, right? For me, it was, I was very like in terms of proximity, I was very close, and mm. and a lot of the things that didn't meet my expectation were personal, mm. very very personal. Mm. So a lot of times where, when I would react, right, and she would pick up on all these things when I'm reacting, when she knows it isn't me, like when I badmouth my old church or mm. I gossip, she will like correct me. You know, so it's, it's sometimes, sometimes you can't hear the Holy Spirit, and that's why they send God send your wife to be louder. <laughs> uh, and and yeah, so sometimes she's like, I know I don't like the way you talk like this. Mm. And when you do this, you do this with like so much bitterness, and wow. you tell me you have healing, but boom, wow. like all this. Yeah, you know, and uh, look who's the preacher. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know, and. And then you realize, you know, you have trigger points. Mm. When people start the gossip, then boom, straight away, your, your carnal nature appears and your, all the bitterness that you kept holding down for the last seven weeks comes up. And, and yeah, it becomes very, it becomes very real. Uh. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think it's just that constant reminder for my wife, you know. Mm. You know don't forget your testimony. Don't forget, you know, mm. don't forget. And, and, and. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Like, at, at, you know, a couple months ago, I, I wasn't at this situation. And now, now that I'm here, right, I'm just, I, I feel very happy, uh, mm. honestly. Like, just knowing that, you know, if it's, if it's God's will, he, he will make it, mm. you know. And, yeah. yeah. I think I want to jump in on that when, when, as you're talking about wives, right? I mean, our wives, um, you just made me realize that actually, why is it that our wives are such a sounding board to us is because for the most part they've been journeying with us for the longest time mm. um, whether whether it was pre-marriage that means during our courting days up to when we got married up to when we have kids they've seen it all they've seen the the highs and lows of our ministry life and and I think they offer that perspective to us to say that is this the same you that's, that that said all these things before all it happened? Yeah. And then and then now you're saying these things, you know, it don't jive. And I think the I think the beauty of having a spouse is that it's just like that. You, they just tell you as it is, right? Mm. And I think that's what as you were talking that. I also reflected upon it and, and I realized that, yeah, that's what my wife also does. And I think it's truly because they also have their journey with God that they are able to download that kind of wisdom or that kind of perspective from the Holy Spirit to be able to nudge us back into, are you really sure you're saying this? Are you really sure you're doing this? Are you are you sure that this is, this is God's best for you so it, it really got me thinking it really got me thinking that that I think if if I'm single and if I have a close dude friend with me you know that has been seeing me from my youth days all the way to my adult days I think if I have such a brother like that probably that guy would say the same thing too like, are you sure you're saying these things or not and, and coming back to what we were saying just now about you know are we doing all these things because we are pastors, I think oftentimes we are being very compliant. Just being compliant because we come under that covering of that church. But 
I think what we are exposing now or what we're saying now is that where is that conviction? Um, I think that's that's really the heart of the matter. What, where is our conviction in terms of what we've been preaching, what we've been talking about? Mm. Um, and, yeah. and are these convictions just near, near, near talking or, or? Yeah. You know? And I want to pick up on that. Like, um, thank you, John, and um, for, for, for pouring your heart and for sharing. And thanks, Dave, for contributing. And I want to pick up on that because like, uh, we're talking about whether you really believe what you preached. Uh, this thing about deconstru- uh, deconstructing, right? It's like a it's it's like a swear word in a lot of like faithful faithful Christian circles, because people sometimes think that when you're deconstructing, uh, you are like backsliding. They equate to that, uh, you know, and maybe they even label as well. You never really believed, but I actually think of it from the uh, from another way that. I feel that deconstruction is absolutely necessary. Why? Because you have to reach su- at some point of, uh, reach to a certain point in your life where you need to really question what you believe in order to answer whether you believe what you really believe. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for yeah. me, I-, I went through this process of deconstructing. I even went through the process of deconstructing. Is that even, I even at-, at one point, I even asked, can I have life without God? Should I have life? Right? Because do I even need God? I haven't reached that point because now I don't need God to, to survive ma, in a way like, because yeah. I, I, I can work, I can do all this, right? But in that process, it really helped me sift out mm. what was necessary yeah. and what was not necessary. What was biblical, what was not biblical. What was a tradition and what is actual mm. theology. Yeah. Um, but it's a painful process. Yeah. It, it, it's never just an intellectual exercise. Yeah. It is a painful and emotional process. But I think that's where we mature. Yeah. Right? Because we don't take lock, stock and barrel. Mm. We don't just take it because somebody said so or, or that that has been the practice of of our time. Mm. But we actually put in that that effort to look through scripture and, and ask those hard questions that sometimes mm. we may not have had the time or we may have been very negligent about it. And we ask ourselves, do we do I myself actually believe and and maybe that's something I really need the grace of God to help me believe these things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, guys, we've been um uh we've been going on for a long time and I think we can go on for yeah. even longer. <laughs> so I need to uh um just kind of like uh I'm gonna do the thing where, you know, pastors always do. In closing, or <laughs> as I close, and then he goes on for another like twenty or thirty minutes, right? But uh, maybe I'll ask just, uh, I'm going to ask one question which has like two components to it, right? Uh, what about the call of God on your life? Mm. What do I mean by that is that I've had people suggest to me, um, not personally, but just online and stuff, they say like, hey, I thought, you, I thought you were called by God. So what now? So how do you guys view that? Like you're called in the ministry and where you are now and maybe what's next for you? What's, what do you see what's next for you? If you know at all. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah. I sort of shared just now that, you know, I, I, I was navigating this a couple of weeks back. And um, yeah, you know, at, at that point, I, I know the scriptures, you know, about God's call. Mm. Gifts and calling are irrevocable. Mm. Wow, it sounds so amazing. But when you're there, right, when you're in the midst of walking away from the call of God, you you realize how irrevocable like irre- irrevocable can mean anything you yeah. know yeah. you know and 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 at a point when you're giving up on it and rejecting it that's that's crazy uh, but i'm so glad that i'm at a point where i'm like yeah i believe so i i, I believe i remember we had this conversation right you asked where where would i be and i said i didn't know because i a couple months back i didn't even know whether i'll be a christian mm uh, now, uh, yeah, I, I, I believe in God's call. I believe mm. in His purpose in my life. I believe that the vision He showed me is still true and, and still yes and amen. And yep. the, the purposes that He has for me is still uh, alive. And, and, and yeah, I want to believe. I want to. And I don't know where you will lead me, whether it's by vocation, whether it's full-time ministry. But, you know, at least at least at this point, right? I can I 
can see it. You know, mm. you know, I have mm. the faith to 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 say, you know what? Yes, I can trust mm. this a uh, God that has, you know, who has who is the God of the our, uh, the the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a he has planned all this and all the whole the whole history of of mankind. Everything he has put in place, and I can trust back in that and say, yeah, you know, he mm. has a plan for my life. Mm. You know, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, mm. well. I think for me, the the calling is is still there. It it just because we see things so linear, right? Mm. And um, we see it because this is our environment. This is what's been shown to us, and so, and so you have to choose whether you are a you want to be a square peg in a round hole or you want to just be in this box. <laughs> um, and I'm very grateful for the mentors that I have in my life and for the people that have been journeying with me to help me ask hard questions and for them to ask me hard questions and then to have time to reflect and have per- perspective over it. And so over the course of this two years from transitioning from uh, full time, um, I still do believe and I know because God affirms it in my heart that my calling is still there as a minister, as a pastor, and I'm still doing that. It, it may not be like what it used to be, yeah. but it has taken a form of its own now. And I've come to recognize that. I've come to embrace that. And I think one of the things that 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 I struggle with was that that it wasn't like before. And because it wasn't like before, yeah. it it mm. it it isn't. Mm. It isn't God's calling. It isn't what I am doing. Mm. But but I've come to to to. I think we're all learning more about God each day if we if we put in the intentionality. And so what I've come to learn more about God is that. That, that cliche Bible line is true. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And I just need to follow. And as I follow, and then God affirms it in my heart that that's where He wants me to be. That's what He wants me to do. Mm. And as for the next season, where I'll be, um, well, I think for me, I've, I'm, I'm more sure that it is in a marketplace. Why? Mm. Because I took some time to just carve out to pray and to get a group of people to pray alongside with me and and just to have them very open-endedly speak into my life um, and to not make the same mistake I made earlier when I transitioned was that before I made those decisions um, that I would check in with them first and, it's, and just to hear what they got to say about this pre-decision that I would make and to just see whether that's that's a perspective that I can take in also. And so for me, that has allowed me to be more certain that the next season would be in the marketplace. As I still serve God in that capacity of being a pastor, being a disciple maker, being a mentor, whatever that the Lord will bring my way. Um, how long, I don't know. But I think from experience, uh, the best is not to put a, a cap there. Mm. But just to say, okay, for as long as you will lead me here, I'll follow. And if not means you seal it, you you shut it and you lead me somewhere else. Yeah. 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 Well, great. Thanks, guys. For me, I, I, I'm kind of um, like, I, I, I kind of like feel like a long time, like what, what you're saying that we see there is, we see ministry as like a divide, ministry marketplace, like a sacred and circular divide. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest reasons why I actually decided to leave a full-time church ministry environment or job was because I wanted to bridge, I wanted to bridge, wanted to know what it means to really bridge that divide more and more. My logic was as simple as this, right? That the one of the reasons why I was an effective youth pastor was because I was a youth before. But if I wanted to disciple people who actually, um, you know, go through all the ups and downs or, or go navigating the corporate uh, life or even in, in um, business or whatever, I need to experience that, right? Mm. So for me, more and more, when people ask me, you know, people ask me this, so you're not serving anymore? I go, no, who say? Then they'll be like, oh, so what are you doing? I'll tell them, well, I'm not officially preaching, 
I'm not a, in the worship team. I'm not an usher or I'm not a hospitality, if that's what you're wondering. Hey, but I'm serving God at my job. Because when I'm at my job, I actually turn up for it and I put in. I don't just appear. And I can tell you, like, I've, I, this actually baffles me. Like, I, I, I know it sounds really weird, but I'm actually really shocked at how much people, like, don't actually take pride and dignity in what they do. Like, they just turn up and they're just there. And for, course for me, I'm a very, I'm, I'm a bit of an intense person, as you can tell sometimes, very driven. Oh, yeah. So for me, it's like, <laughs> for me, it's like you're doing, if you're going to do something, do it. Like, yeah. if you're just going to appear, then don't, right? Yeah. I mean, of course, I get it. People have to appear. People have to pay bills and all that. But I feel like all you need is just that, just a little bit of intentionality appearing at your workplace, a bit of excellence, a bit of encouragement, a bit of empathy. Yeah. And man, you're already being sought and liked. Yeah. And so for me, I say that. And then it's the same thing with family as well. I'm serving God by doing my best for my family, not yeah. just providing, but guiding guiding them. And um, and yeah, I, I also don't know whether I will ever go back into full-time ministry as like a pastor in a local church. But I know for sure in the next maybe at least 10 years, I really want to um, focus on the marketplace and really just continue to see how God is going to be able to move through me and in me. Because I can tell you, right, like ministry is everywhere. There's yeah. need everywhere. And one of the things uh, that I really, really am appreciative about is that while now that I'm out of the church environment full time, I actually have been given opportunity or I've had opportunity to minister to people mm. whom in all, in all honesty, I would have never met That's when right. I was in church. Yeah. Or I would have never had the time to actually journey with these people um, uh, or, this, or, or speak into these situations when I was still in church. So I, I think like we, we have been limiting and we have been boxing God in. And I feel like um, this is what God wants to continue to do. So like all the things that we had, we were used to, I don't think it will go away. Mm. All this, I don't think it will, there will be, it is wrong or anything like that. But I do feel like we have to be very discerning mm. and sensitive to what God is shifting um, us in, first of all, individually, and also, um, you know, the church. Mm. I kind of like, I do have one question for the, for the first of summer, but I thought I just want to throw this in. I, I just read this thing. It's not something that I've not known before, but <clears throat> is this thing about God's story? Because a lot of times we see ourselves as, our, as the main character in our own story, yeah. which is not wrong, but actually all of us are part of God's story. And sometimes God, wants us to go through different chapters, mm. right? It doesn't mean he's closed the book on us, but it just means that maybe for certain chap for certain chapters, it's just different for us and he's moving on to the next chapter. And we really don't know what the following chapter will have, but we just have to say, continue trusting that his plans are good yeah. Yeah. and they're for us, they're, they're, for, they're to prosper us and not to harm us, yeah. to give us a hope and a future. Yeah. Maybe I'll end with, um, I'll ask you guys this, um, what advice would you give um, to anybody who's maybe in ministry right now and they're thinking of like moving or they have just left ministry? What kind of advice or what 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 area or what thing would you like to speak um, into them or over them? Uh, I don't want to joke about it. <laughs> I wanted to say a joke, but I better not. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. This is technically not a church or Christian channel, right? So you can say whatever you, whatever you want. I, I think the from from my own journey is that um, surround yourself with with people that will be real with you. Uh. Mm. Yeah, um, people that will say it as it is. That's one. Uh, two is comes back really to your walk with God. Mm. You just really have to have that walk with God, uh, that that intentional communion with God. And and that's where you you actually learn more about God and what He has for you. Um, but on, on a very practical side of things, if, if you're considering uh, leaving your vocation as a full-time pastor or church worker, um, have have, you know that that um, courage to speak to your superiors, mm. um, share with them. You know you never know. 
they could be sharing the same senti- sentiments as you. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it may not be something that is 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 uh, popular. You know, where people speak about these things. You know, because like what we said earlier. You know, supposed to be for life, right? But oftentimes it's not. It's seasonal. Could be seasonal. Yeah. And it may not be because something is really bad or something's really wrong. But you just could sense that. Okay, I think my time here is up. It's just just speak, just share. And and I think get people to 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 come along and and pray alongside with you. Um and I think from my own experience, uh, speaking to to a wise counsel of godly people helps. Mm. Yeah, people who will, you know, um encourage you as well as admonish you, you know. Mm. Yeah. Because sometimes you just you're limited. You're limited in your perspective. Yeah, mm. I agree. I I think um, if you're you're thinking of of quitting and leaving, it's very important. I like, I didn't have that. You know, my my leader left <laughs> during that, that that period. So I was always accountable to to my cell leader. Yeah, accountability. Yeah, so I was accountable to someone, but she she left as well. So I had nobody. So I I think my advice would be to be very conscious. I know it's very difficult, especially when you're hurt and when mm. you're angry, right? It's very easy and it's almost a path of least resistance to react. Oh yeah, on that part, right? If we are angry, if we are just full with emotion, just don't make any decisions then. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Just just at that point, right? Just stop. Yeah. Stop is the best, uh, <laughs> the best thing to do at that point. When you're angry, I, and, and just... Just by doing that, right, you have stopped yourself from sinning and you stop yourself from causing other people to sin. Yeah. I think that's very important. So you have to be very conscious of it. Because sometimes you feel very justified mm-hmm. by it, I know. So I see how other people react, right, to the to the have what's happening. They can say the worst things in the world. And I'm like, wow. Christian. Uh. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And so so a lot of times, especially in a position when you're working in or you're serving in church and you want to quit. So when you're angry, yeah, you know check stop and then you know just check yourself with someone you know where is this coming from what is this doing and and i think one very important thing to do is not push people away i think these are the mistakes that this this one mistake that i made was that to push people away mm. so you know you you have the tendency la, right i i think i think when you're angry uh, the the easiest thing and the path of least resistance uh, is to leave the whatsapp chat group you know, and I think I did that multiple times. <laughs> yeah, it's like, ah, oh, I'm gonna leave the cell in the chat, lah. You know, I talk with these people, so they know I'm angry. Mm. You know, so you you have so when you start pushing people away, I think it, it, it first it deprives you of wise counsel, and two it it uh, people will not want to approach you, even if they have a word for you, even if you have mm. something that can heal you, right? They see you pushing everybody away and and mm. they will feel like oh, maybe not lah, right? And sometimes it comes from the 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 simplest, like it can come from your your youth, you know, it can come from your congregant and and um, I and I push a, a lot of people away. Lah. Like when yep. they came to me and they wanted to offer their support and I just went you know, I went off at them. And mm. yeah, so these two things I think will really just if you can do these two things that transition out will be so much smoother and yep. you 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 come out of it, right? Without burning bridges and you you have friends still. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. You won't feel lonely after that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think if I combine both what you're saying and then a little bit of what I'll add, you know, yeah. so it's just don't be in a hurry. Mm. Make it take it make it a process. Mm. Um, I mean, be be courageous enough to even ask the question or even to approach people with the question, um, but don't react. You know, mm. make it make it into a process. Because I think, uh, like you mentioned, don't re- don't lash out or don't make. A, there's this saying, right? Don't make uh, permanent decisions based on temporary feelings. Because the mm-hmm. truth is, is that yes, once you make certain decisions, there's actually no turning back. Yeah. There's no going back when. Um, even if you like withdraw a resignation, but sometimes that resignation itself can cause a social mm-hmm. impact already, right? Yeah. Where people may feel distrust or they you may lose credibility or whatever. So don't make the decision 
really, really pray and also think about why. Um, like for me, I was in a place where there was a lot of emotions. I, I cannot deny that. But beyond that, there was also a great dissatisfaction within me where I just felt like the vision and the values were not aligned. And I won't go into that because I really don't want to like take any more time than we, that we ought to. But really, you got to think about that and process that. And for me, I think one of the things that I would say was is that um, take time because what is very important is uh, just on a practical level, if you have a buffer, uh, if your church actually gives you space to rest, but while at the same time still like, you know, uh, providing for you. Um, because for me, when I left, I just took the first job that I, 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 I could get, which was with a friend. And it was, I, it was in an area that I thought I could do. I realized I can do it. But I thought, yeah, I could bring myself to like it, <laughs> but it's not really the thing, right? But so, so I'm going to be, I'm a very real person, right? I'll speak the truth. Um, in Malaysia, certainly, I think for most parts of the world, based on my understanding, uh, the employability of a pastor or a full-time worker is actually very, very low. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so that's something that you will want to consider and talk to people um, uh, and, um, again, that's a whole different topic altogether, but I'm not saying that as, as a, as, as a object or tool for, for fear to stop you from doing what you feel you need to do, but it's certainly something that you have to be prepared for. La, I think, yeah. um, uh, did you want to say some, some, uh, you know, it's something you prepared for because yeah. you're not just making a decision that will impact yourself personally, unless you are a single person, but it will impact your family. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I, I also realized that, hey, there's actually the reality is that sometimes when you leave the church, you will, you will lose certain certain friendships. Right? It's a oh, reality. Yeah. Yeah. It may not be outright because they hate you, because they go like, oh, you know, right? but it could be just practicality. You know, out of, sight, out, out of sight, out of mind. Like I can tell you the amount of, one of the things that I had to wrestle with, so I don't miss the platform, I miss the people, right? But one of the things I had to wrestle with is that, hey, you know, some of these guys, I don't even hear from them anymore. Whereas last time it's always like, hey, pastor, this pastor, that, hey, how are you? But now it's like, boop, zilch, zero, you know? Um, and, and that has, a, has an impact. And these are some of the realities that you will have to face. Um, I know we should have ended, like maybe like one hour ago, <laughs> but, but uh, just, I, I don't have, I, I, I don't want to be talking all the way for the last point. So just again, back to you guys. Do you guys have anything you want to add or say? Um, anything that that comes to mind otherwise I oh. think yeah. no you go uh, I, I think I think um, um, you know I, I, I said just now that I had a lot of youth pastors come through my life and a lot of mm. these, quite a number of them are no longer mm. pastors and some, quite a number of them are no longer Christians as well mm. uh, a lot of them are still you know, pastors. How they have quit being pastor, but uh, I just wanted to to encourage if you, if you're about to quit and you feel like um, there is no future here or you feel discouraged, I think uh, God is good. Uh. Mm. God is faithful, and I think and I can say this. Uh, I only can could say this like maybe two weeks ago. Mm. So I would like to encourage someone that. You know, he, yes, he is faithful. You know, he, yep. and he is good. And even if you go back to circular, even if you lose friends, you know, God is still good. Yep. Yeah, and he's he he will not abandon you. Mm. you know? Yeah. And the, and sometimes it's very easy when you're in a position of hurt to see what God is doing and how He's providing for you and how He's blessing you. And I certainly uh, did that. So I, I, I want I want people to just sometimes just just stop and just think oh God's providing. Yep. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And Whether we realize it or not. Yeah. Yeah. And there is there is a light, there is an end to your pain and there is the light at the end of the tunnel. So just that's a very good encouragement, very important one as well. Yeah. Um David, you got anything? Totally wanna to say that also, but uh, the other point that can really help us uh, as ministers, as budding ministers or as senior ministers uh, in whatever setting that you are in is to build friendships um, to be 
to build genuine friendships, not just for networking purposes, not just not just for ministry purposes. Yeah, yeah not just for so ministry important. purposes. Yeah. Not because you are you want that person to invite you to speak or you want to be oh, yeah, part of yeah. that group, um, but to really build genuine friendships. Why? Because there will be days where you would find that you're alone. Mm. That are you the only one that feels this way, or mm. are you? Mm. Are you the only one that 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 is struggling with this issue? Yeah. But when you form like a band of brothers or a band of sisters for that matter, you can really be real with one another. Yeah. And you can just, you know, not have that pastor or that minister or that, you know, ministry leader uh, burden on you and just say, hey, can we just talk? Can we just... Can we just share with one another? I think that's so important. Uh, what I've seen in, in the past gen is that most journey alone. And when stuff happens, they feel totally isolated. And, and, and the friends, the so-called friends that they have around them are just for the sake of ministry or network or, or you know, you, 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 what's that, what's that, um, that thing called you, I, I rub your back, you rub my back kind of thing, mm. that, that mm -hmm. tit for tat thing, you know. Um, but but what I really see in, in those that do it so well is that because they've got real genuine friends that come around them, that encourage them, that, 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 that say the things that they really need to say because that's being true friends. And when, when the curtain is up or down, it don't matter because you know that these friends of yours are there with you. I think that's so, uh, that's so precious as a minister, that's so precious as a pastor to have when you have um, friends that are co-ministers, co-workers with you that can do that with you, that really do life with you and together, not just with you, but your family, with your kids. Mm. And uh, I think that's something if I could just add on would be that, yeah. Mm. Great, great. Well, last thing, really this time. <laughs> True preacher. Obviously, as we shared and as we talked, um, this I acknowledge that this is not going to be, this this probably would generate more questions than answers, to be honest. So I'm going to ask you guys, is, are you okay if like for, if there is a, uh, if there is a, uh, a circumstance where somebody actually has a question they would like to direct at you, is it okay if, if I included your socials like in the description below where they can reach out to you yeah, um, sure. and, and, and all that? Yeah, okay, for good, sure. cool. So, hey, thank you so much for watching this, I don't know, this movie. <laughs> this is pretty boring movie, really long and boring. But thanks, John. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> it's yeah. very yeah. long and boring, boring movie. I don't know mm -hmm. whether you will even go... I don't know what's the limit on YouTube videos. I don't know how long that would... Whether this will even go all up. But uh, again, this, is, this was just for... Um, an avenue and an opportunity for us to share our story. I hope it was helpful to you. I hope it was insightful. I hope it blessed you. And if you have any questions that you would like to direct to any one of us, I think um, we'll put in some uh, description below. I'm going to say first up, I cannot promise I will answer every question or every inquiry, but uh, I'll do do my best. And I think um, you know my my friends and my brothers right here will do the same. So hey, thank you for tuning in. Don't like, don't share, don't subscribe because I don't know when the next video will come up. I am the anti-influencer. But anyway, goodbye. See you all. Thank you. God bless.